these professors that we speak of all the time, Marlena Malice, I mean, these professors are the cream of the crop, you know, and, and they know what they're doing. And we all have to admire and respect their teaching style. Nonetheless, they've made such an impact. That's baritone Jacob Soulier. Our guest on Heart of the Arts today is an award-winning opera singer, and we're going to talk about his roots here in the Valley, his upcoming performance this August 27th, and all the steps he's taking to become a performer at the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. I'm Melissa Green. Welcome to another episode of Heart of the Arts. It's lovely to see you. It's good to see you too. Thanks for having me. Of course. So it was kind of interesting. We met at uh, an event in Scottsdale, the League of American Pen Women. That's how I first heard about you. And I'm excited to have you on because you're definitely an artist in Arizona to watch. So I want to first ask if, uh, if you consider yourself an Arizonan. And I wanted to ask a little bit about your background, if I may. Sure. I do consider myself an Arizonan. However, I wasn't born in Arizona. I was born in Bulgaria. So I would like to consider my roots are from Bulgaria. Um, So I was adopted by a family uh, originally from Michigan. They had brought me out here to Arizona. Uh, My father owns a business out here. So we pursued opportunities out here, and then eventually I just started going out to school here, and it was pretty nice. So yes, definitely in Arizona. <laughs> wow. Do you have any roots uh, tied back to Eastern Europe, Eastern European music at all, or anything that maybe popped up in, later in life? I don't, but I, I've always had a love for music, even when I was a kid. I grew up around it. You know, I had... I was in the Phoenix Boys Choir at a very young age. I was accepted when I was around seven or eight. Um, and then I just stuck with the music. Yeah. I started with the Schubert. Um, I was accepted by Georg Stangelberger, who was the director at the time of the program. Legendary. And yes. Right. Yes. Legendary for the Phoenix Boys Choir. Um, and he said, you know, you can do this. He said, you want to join? And I said, yeah, I think I can do it. <laughs> I ended up staying in there for like five or so years. I graduated in the master's, which was the highest level you could graduate from in the choir. Cool. And then I just started slowly continuing my music career. Yeah. I love that you were part of that uh, ensemble and community. Like that's that and Rosie's house are like two of my favorite things about this community. Like, honestly, the work that they do in their mission is really what every schooling and and organization should be about. Right, right. And the Phoenix Boys Choir didn't just teach me about music. It taught me about how to be a bigger person as well. Yeah. Especially when Georg was there. I mean, they do tours all around the world and some of them domestically, sometimes internationally. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's a great organization, nonprofit. Um, My father, like I said, he even owns a business. He did some work for them. Oh when I was in the choir. So um, yeah, great organization. We always say, oh, nowadays more than ever, but that kind of community and connection really truly is more important than ever. Can you talk a little bit about uh, where you went to school before we get to the main topic of this interview? Sure. So um, I went to high school at Boulder Creek High School in Anthem. Um, I was there in the uh, choir program. That was one of my electives. So I stuck with that all four years. Uh, with um, Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas influenced me throughout the four years to pursue classical singing and classical voice. So um, he introduced me to a colleague of his, Professor Mary Sue Hyatt at Kent State University, who was a voice teacher. Um, Top of the class, emerita status. She's unbelievable. Um, But in a sense, we ended up growing together musically and our friendship grew. And it kind of just took over so fast ever since high school. So music is, it's going, <laughs> happens. Yeah. So what about post high school studies? In a sense, education for me besides music, I was a very good bowler and I was a very good golfer. I was, I was, I really was. I, I was third in state in bowling. Too. You were third in state? Yeah. In Arizona for, I think a year or so. Oh my yeah. gosh. Cool. You know what? One of my, I, um, in college, when I was getting my music degree, I, um, worked at a sports bar 
And during the off season, our favorite thing to put on was bowling bloopers because they're like the funniest <laughs> thing to see. Yes, they are. Right, they? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That is so cool. Well, my father, my father was, uh, on the amateur pro golf tour, he was a very, very good golfer. So that also grew up in my roots, becoming a golfer. And he really influenced me to do that. So it just happened upon besides music that I did a lot of golfing and bowling growing up. So Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's perfect for Arizona. Yes. Golfing, definitely. You know, the yeah. scenery and stuff. Definitely. Yeah. Let's talk about your first, let's go back to uh, Randall Stroop, because you first performed with him at Carnegie Hall. That was your first Yes, that was my first um, connection at Carnegie Hall. I was there with Kirk Douglas in the Boulder Creek High School. Um, okay. At the time, we were given the repertoire for the, the performance, and it had some solo music in it. And I went to the director, Kirk, and I said, you know, I wonder if I write to him, you think he'd write back. I kid you not. He wrote back. He's like, you want to audition? You can. I was like, wow, that's great. So I auditioned and um, we were in a room full of over 300 singers that were high school singers. And at the time I didn't know I was the only one that emailed him about the auditions. Oh. So he, he went into the rehearsal and he said, who would like to audition for the part? No one, not a single person raised their hand except me. It was the greatest thing in my life. It oh was so funny. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I put my hand up. I said, yeah, I would like to. And at the time he knew me because we were emailing. So um, he said, you got it, kid. And I did it. And um, uh, a while ago, um, he and I wrote when I told him I was going to Manhattan School of Music. And he's very encouraging about my career. So he he's a very nice uh, conductor and a mentor. So Wow. Yes. I love that story. And it just like, you followed your intuition where like the collective was kind of like, oh, this is scary. Oh, I don't want to raise my hand and go for it. Yes. So bold. Yes. Well, I, I've always had a drive for Carnegie Hall. Who doesn't want to perform at Carnegie Hall, let alone have a solo? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And at the yes. time I was so influenced by music because I was involved at Christ Lord Lutheran Church in Cave Creek carefree. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, everyone's doing music there. And I was surrounded myself with musicians all the time. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to feel a part of that. And I just said, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. And I did it. So... Tell us about the Manhattan School of Music and how this second amazing opportunity for a solo performance came about. So the Manhattan School of Music is a wonderful school of music in New York. What I've noticed about it is the internationalism. There are so many international students from all around the world coming together for six, seven months. And we just get together in this classroom. We would learn about the great Schubert, Mozart, Beethoven. And it's really inspiring to see that. So the School of Music is truly one of the best. Other than that, it's also known for its wonderful connections. You know, New York City has numerous connections for the mm. classical industry. Yeah. And um, when I started attending there, I met a few people, Kent Tridel, um, Marlena Malice, um, just to name a few. And you get to know these people and they tell you, you know, well, why don't you do that? Well, why don't you audition for that? You know, well, I know someone here. I, I think this would be good for you to do. I could call them up and say that you're auditioning. So, you know, it's the connections also at the School of Music that separate the School of Music from other universities sometimes because they have those connections. And so I, that was also part of why I auditioned for this international competition, because I was influenced by mentors to do it. Um, I auditioned. I got an email over the summer of last year saying I won. Wow. You're more than welcome to come and sing oh. in the Carnegie Hall reciter of the winner's recital. Um and, you know, it was remarkable. I mean, they have not just, you know, singing, they have piano, cello, violin. And, you know, you get up there and you see a child that's tinier than I am play Chopin. Mm -hmm. like, how are they doing it? Yeah. So it's very inspiring to see that. Yeah. And it's a wonderful competition. And I was very, very fortunate to have won. And this was my first international competition ever. So to apply and win the first one. I was like, wow. That's, that's huge. That's Congrats. Yes. Thank you.
you know, a few reviews talk about how, um, how distinguished, I guess is my term that I would use for your sound because you're still like in your like pretty early twenties, correct? Yes. I, I just turned 24 in July. So okay, cool. I'm still, I'm still a baby in the opera world as they'll say. July what? July 13th. 13th. Okay. I'm 21st. So are you really, I didn't yeah. know that. Oh, yeah. Great. We're cancer. Cancerians. Yes. Yeah. Cancerians. We're really likable. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes. So you're so young and you have such a distinguished sound and I was curious because sometimes I think about the first like vocalist I was ever drawn to, especially as a young kid. And I definitely had this niche for like, um, I don't know if you remember Tracy Chapman from the 90s. I do. But yes. just kind of I was really drawn to women with that kind of vocal tone and yes. that depth. What who were some of the first voices that really perked your ears up as a kid? Elton John, for sure. Oh, wow. If it weren't for Elton John, I wouldn't have gotten into piano. And if I didn't get into piano, I wouldn't have never gotten into music. Yes. Yeah. Elton John, for sure. And I've seen him at least five times. I've, I haven't seen any other, you know, rock star artist. Oh, um, but besides him, you know, I, I've been uh, to the Met a few times. I've seen a few of the top artists um, at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, so, but it was definitely Elton John that started the career for me. Uh, to want to start music to a point. So, yes. Yeah. And then, um, again, we're, we're going to get back to your recital, but who else, like, in the classical world? You know, I would have to say someone actually that's still current and performing a lot um, would be uh, Lucas Meacham. Lucas Meacham is a wonderful baritone. He's a lyric baritone. He uh, possibly still does study with uh, Marlena Malice. Um, and his overall message to the opera community and his voice is just wonderful. And I've always admired him a lot. Um, I've never told him that, of course, but he's a huge fan <laughs> of mine and um, hope to someday meet him in the cool. appropriate time. But yeah, definitely a voice to listen to if you have time. At what point did it really settle into yourself that this is my purpose? Yes, I, I knew that singing was my purpose because... I I was always very cocky as a high schooler. Oh. When, I, when I was in high school, I used to be in choir and sometimes it'd be like, oh, I can sing. I don't need to do this stuff. I can <laughs> sing. You know, we all have that as a, as sometimes even yes. today, students are, you know what that's like. Yes, yes, definitely. But I was very much so, I can do this. It's not a problem. So then, you know, eventually I got that wake up call from someone and they're like, you know, if you really want to do this, let me show you how to do it the right way. And um, I was like, really? And they're like, yeah, really? So I started taking private lessons um, with a professor here in Carefree. Her name is Dr. Mary Sue Hyatt. And boy, she just really opened my eyes to singing and classical repertoire. And I got to know some of her colleagues and work with them. Uh, Henry Venanzi, former Arizona Opera Chorus Master. Um, Dale Dreyfus, who's at ASU, School Professor of Music. Um, Jan Meyer Thompson, who's emerita for piano at ASU. So, you know, it's it's a start, but it's also yeah. who you get to know. Absolutely. And just building your community wherever your career takes you, doing it in different right. cities. Right. And as much as, as having a good voice matters, it's also about keeping a good relationship with everyone you know. Mm, yes, definitely. Yes. So how did it feel after you performed at Carnegie Hall again? Tell us about that experience. <laughs> so before I have, I was with my wonderful pianist and before I said to her, cause this was her debut. And I said, are you feeling okay? She's like, I'm nervous. And she said, how are you feeling? And I said, I'm feeling like I'm about to make history, mm. you know, performing at Carnegie Hall in the moment wasn't so much nerves for me. It was more historic. Mm. You have to think of who has performed on the stage mm. of these halls. I mean, these are renowned artists, mm -hmm. past, present, and um, to perform there where they have, where I haven't. I mean, it's a feeling I'll never forget. Oh. It gives me goosebumps just thinking about it again. I bet. Yeah, it was amazing. And then what did you do right afterwards? What's kind of your after performance routine if you have one? So my after performance routine was really interesting. I was with a very good friend of mine 
and um, I performed and they were like, okay, now you can go, you know, sit in the audience and watch the rest of the performers. I was like, I can't do that. No way. <laughs> so I went with a good friend of mine. I went outside and I said to him, I was like, how did this sound? Cause he is a tenor at the school of music as well. And he said, that was so good. Oh. And, um, you know, we just took a moment together to calm down, get your recollections together taking a moment after I perform to kind of evaluate what I just did is helpful for me. Yeah. And, you know, I hear more and more these days that, um, you know, the cliche about the journey, not the destination, because when right. you kind of get there, you are it. Once you're actually it, the thing comes about and you do it, you're kind of like, OK, what's what's the next thing? Yes, I'm fondly into that as well. I remember um um, I think I, I remember calling a colleague of mine and he said to me, how did it feel? I said, it was great. What's next? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. it's like you always have to think ahead. There's not nonstop. It doesn't stop. You have to just keep performing. Yeah. And that's especially at this young age when you're trying, when you're trying so hard for someone to recognize you and just pick up the phone and say, Hey, come here. You uh, know what I mean? Yeah. And it's great that you had the experience of that being a historic one, because sometimes people have these big, grandiose ideas around when I get here, it'll be this and I'll be so happy in this. And sometimes that can lead to like disappointment. And Yes. It's also a process. You have to have people there to tell you when to slow down, whether that be a colleague or a friend telling you, hey, this is a lot this week. Why don't you stop? Or you need someone to say, are you ever going to finish that role? You know, you need someone there, whether it be a voice teacher, a mentor, your grandmother, the dog, someone there to tell you, hey, I'm here to help you and guide you along your journey. Because in the field of opera, you can't do this alone. Let's talk a little bit about the process of kind of becoming a professional, which I think kind of ties into the next question of learning the music for the recital, learning the music in general. What if someone's considering it? Can you walk them through like the process? Because like you said, you kind of thought to yourself, oh, I can sing. For someone wanting to start an opera, it's very, very, very important. And I think it's probably the most important thing is you have to find a good voice teacher and a good voice teacher with a reputation for building voices. That's a really good piece of information to give though. Well, well that alone is because, you know, even, even in the, the highest schools of learning, you can get the teacher with the best bio and that doesn't necessarily mean they can teach. Mm -hmm. that, that means they can sing yeah. well. But does that mean they can teach just as well? And you really have to watch out for that, especially as young singers, you know. So um, that's probably the most important thing. Besides that, I would definitely encourage young singers to be patient and to stay true to themselves. A lot of times we have voices come, whether it be through friends or colleagues, and they blind our inner artistic thoughts of music. So it's important that we stay true ourselves and sometimes in our beliefs. Um, but in terms of being patient, which is another very key word for starting a career in this as a singer, patience is everything. I mean, you cannot rush the development of the voice, but you know, a lot of times young singers will take the, the time to imitate other singers and manufacture their voice. And it's just, a, it's a waste of time. It hurts their voice. And, but you know, we're we're guilty of it, aren't we? I mean, yeah. Well, I was gonna say sometimes it, it's a maturity thing yes. and accepting feedback that maybe someone else is really trying to pull out a more authentic sound from you, right? That you don't know you can make yet, or yes. or that you're physically not trusting. Yes, and we're all we're all guilty of wanting to sound like Luciano, <laughs> or or you know, you go to a stoplight and hear someone screaming at Taylor Swift song and it's like, please stop. But you know, we're all guilty of it. Yeah. But you know, for wanting to become a true uh total package musician with the artistic integrity, you have to hold that back. Mm -hmm. You have to hold those pieces back mm -hmm. and allow the voice to develop in a natural and healthy way. 
Absolutely. So, um, and you know, you only get one, you only get one voice. Was there anything in your college studies or even high school that you knew you were prepared for or the opposite you weren't prepared enough for? So I think, I think in the terms of the preparation, most of the times I see singers just start the music. Even if they're just saying they're practicing and they're singing, it's not actually practicing and singing. You're just singing. Um, to learn the music and to properly prepare it, you really need to start with giving the appropriate repertoire that has been approved by your voice teacher. Um, second, you, you need to do the research. And this is a huge deal. I mean, I'm guilty of it as well. Sometimes we don't always have the time to do the research. You know, we get last calls for church gigs and or whether it be to fill in an opera spot. Sometimes you don't have time. But if you have the time, you should always do the research, um, get the word for word translations, the Castell, the Beaumarchais. Um, and depending on it, sometimes you're going to have to get the dictionaries out and just do word for word translations. And then there's the composer's intent, too. Right. So are you... After you learn all that, are you trying to capture the character with the exact traits given by the composer? Like, how do you play to the composer's intent? I try to follow it as much as possible, me personally. Mm -hmm. I'm not at that point in my career where I can be like, yeah, it says it's a half, but I'm going to make it a whole. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have to. I'm a student. I must respect the composer right now. That mm -hmm. That's my job. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I can interpretate very differently too. You can, you can interpret scores in so many ways. I know. And sometimes <laughs> people forget that. And sometimes yeah. will people will be like, wow, that sounded unbelievable. And it's like, it's not the voice, it's the interpretation. What are some struggles that musicians have obtaining their degree? I think, I think, well, you know, I think for voice, musicians, classical voice musicians, I feel that a lot of schools of music are not preparing them for the real world because they cannot pay for private teachers, um, especially yeah. private coaches, you know, that oh, yeah. they should be employed for each of the languages we sing in. And because of this, the result is the voice teacher in many colleges and universities have to teach it all in the voice lesson. And it's only like at Juilliard or the conservatories or the schools of music where we see a teacher for every aspect of becoming an opera singer. So we invest so much money for our education during the school year. And I feel that because of this, students are not able to explore every aspect of their summer opportunities. And, and their strengths. Yes. Too. Right. School is so expensive too. I mean, once I you know, once you start I, getting into it, it's just it's really outrageous. I mean, I am not like super old. I'm thirty four, <laughs> and when I went to college, I was paying like seventy dollars an hour for private lessons because I had to. Yes. Like I didn't have any money in my bank account right. because I was like, I have to do this or else. Right. And, you know, it's it's very unfortunate because sometimes we get we get very, very good voices that come through the schools of music and the department or the the aid offices or whoever you want to say it might be won't stick up for these wonderful voices. And then we lose these voices and then they lose their confidence in becoming a singer, ultimately resulting in them not wanting to sing anymore. And it's wow. it's very unfortunate. And singing is one of the most like powerful things like, you know, in life that you can do. Isn't right. it just like the most magical thing? That it is very magical, we... but it's it's also like the opera world isn't as strong as it used to be, in my opinion. And when we when we turn away students like that, that can't afford it, that are willing to continue our tradition of the Mozart and the Bohem, and you turn them down from getting their education, you're ultimately pushing students away. You're pushing the future away. And it's very disappointing. So money is very important as a as a student. And it's it's one of the main struggles right now for a lot of singers. Of course. Um, do you think that there's a way to rectify that? Or is, has there been any discussion around that? I, I think... In circles? Right. Especially with people your age? Yes. I think the best thing to do is to find 
still again, find a good voice teacher and trust them and be open with them. And sometimes those conversations don't always have to happen in the voice lesson. Sometimes they have to happen outside and say, look, I'm really going through something right now. This is the situation. And you would be surprised how much pull a voice teacher has if they want you. So um, that that's a route to go. Also, it's just to, to make sure that you review, you know, the, the FAFSA guidelines and all of that and the grants and the scholarships that are available and the work study programs. I mean, there's there's money out there to be made. Yeah. Um, but sometimes they don't always make it um, noticeable. They don't make it noticeable, and um, it would be nice if universities and schools did a little more, um, a little more to educate yes. students. Because I came from a family of people who had never gone to college, and I didn't know what I was doing. I right. could have gotten more grants and money. Yes. No. Exactly. <laughs> I just had no idea what I could do. Yes. You know, I, I made this joke earlier to a friend of mine. I said, you know, they're going to teach me how to sing, but they're not going to teach me how to balance my checkbook at the end of the month. Right. You know, because yeah. the financial aspect of singing, no one talks about it, but it can be sticky sometimes. What can you tell us about your upcoming performance on August 27th? Yeah. So I, I have a few opportunities, not just in Arizona as well, but hopefully in New York and in Ohio. But the one in Arizona is very special to me because uh, every year, which we haven't been able to do it because of COVID, so this will be the first time in two years, mm-hmm. we do uh, fundraiser concerts okay. for students, for me, for the for the student recognition fund at our church, so we can bring in talented musicians from around the world, some from France, some from the Curtis Institute of Music. I mean, these are the, the cream of the crop. Okay. I mean, they're the best musicians in the world. So we do this fundraiser to raise money for this this fund. Um, so the recital will feature Dover Beach by Samuel Barber with the Allegro String Quartet, as well as some wonderful recital repertoire accompanied by my mentor and accompanist Henry Venanzi from Cincinnati Opera and Dr. Jan Meyer Thompson, Professor Emerita from Arizona State University. Well, congrats on all of your success and your upcoming recital and season. Lastly, I want to know where our listeners can follow you on social media. Listen, listeners can follow me on my YouTube by Googling Jacob Sulier. Uh, they can also search me on the web by Googling Jacob Sulier or jacobsulier.com. And collaboration with ctlcarefree.org, which will showcase our Curtis on tour performances, which will include Avery Galliano, who just won a $100,000 Chopin competition. She was first placed, and we're very, very fortunate to have her be performing at our church coming up. So a lot of good things happening coming up, and we hope to see you there. We're looking forward to it. Thanks so much for joining us on Heart of the Arts today. Great. Thanks, Melissa. That's baritone Jacob Soulier, who will be performing this August 27th at Christ the Lord Lutheran Church in Carefree. You can find details at Jacob Soulier, J-A-C-O-B-S-O-U-L-L-I-E-R-E dot com for more information. For KVOX Heart of the Arts, I'm Melissa Green. Heart of the Arts.